Welcome, I'm Peter Horky and this is a Houseboat Talk. Today, for the first time, I feel like I'm posting an interview that's a bit like an unarmed grenade. Rainer Zittelmann has been publishing books all over the world and he has dedicated himself to proving scientifically that capitalism is simply the best setup we humans have come up with so far. So let's get down to business. I look forward to the discussion, especially those who will listen to the end. Mr. Zittelmann, thank you very much that you find the time for interview with you. I have two books here. Ten biggest mistakes of anti-capitalists and Capitalism is not a problem, it's a solution. Yes. Uh, if I translate it properly, excuse yes. me, if it, I'm uh, not so uh, concrete. I saw the materials that you are talking on that topic all around the world. Really, on all the continents. Yes. So it's not only writing, this is your personal mission. You feel it very important for you. Yes, absolutely, this is what I'm doing. I. You know, I, was, uh, I did different things in my life. I worked as an historian, as a journalist, and then I was an entrepreneur for 15 years, mm -hmm. owner of the company, but I sold it seven years ago. And what I do now, I do my research, writing my books or articles for a lot of newspapers and travel all over the world to spread the message why I love capitalism. Uh, that's it, because uh, after you sell your company, uh, you can write the books, stay in Germany, no travel, just enjoying time and traveling so much and all around the world, it takes time, it takes energy. So what is the core of the mission? You want to explain the people to keep the way for capitalism or w w what is the core of your mission? Yes, these are, it's, these are two things. First of uh, one, of course, I like to promote this idea to explain that capitalism is the best way to escape poverty. Mm -hmm. And you know, capitalism has a neg very negative uh, image in most of the countries, everywhere in the world. And so I think there are not enough people, too few people to understand why capitalism is not the problem, but the solution. This is why I'm writing my books. But I'm writing also another kind of books about personal success mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to help people to, to be successful and it's not only that I'm talking about my books I'm also listening to, to people. Yesterday for example I had a meeting here with the chief uh, economist from uh, foreign minister mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, spoke with him. I spoke with a professor from a think tank and so and so I combine it. So half of the time I'm talking and the other time I'm listening because I'm writing on my next book and the title will be uh, Liberty Road Trip uh -huh. uh, and it will be a, a, this year I, I was in 16 countries next year I think 35 countries and so it's a lot of experience I meet different people see a lot everywhere mm -hmm. in the world and this will be the topic of uh, one of my my next books. You touch the approach of the people all around the world to the to capitalism as a topic or capitalism as the way of life. And you said that usually uh, people don't like it too much. Yes. The part of this book uh, are just the results of survey uh, of your excavations about the approach to capitalism. So please tell me, how is it around the world? You mentioned that the people usually dislike it. Yes, this was not a big surprise. Uh, I, I, wouldn't, uh, uh, I, I would not commission a poll only to learn that people in most countries in the world, they don't like capitalism. I, I knew it before, so this was not the reason. But there were only very few polls about the image of capitalism. Usually they asked only like one question. You like it, don't like Who it. Who you like or not. Yes. But we confronted our respondents with 34 different statements. And so it was much more detailed because I, I wanted to know what they don't like on capitalism. And the other thing, I wanted to find out how much has it to do with the word and how much with what the word stands for. Because the word has a negative connotation for most of the people. And so first we asked a couple of questions without using the word, only mm -hmm. to describe what capitalism means without using the word. And then we had other questions where we used the word. And so okay. we could even measure what is the effect when using the word. And we could compare um, uh, countries now, we've done it in 31 countries, in Asia, in, uh, in Latin America, in Europe, 
United States and now we start also in Africa. We have the first African country, this is Nigeria and I have the results in the next weeks from uh, Uganda. The next be one. Interesting. And if we compare it, you see that there are only six or seven countries depending on the questions where people like capitalism, then there are some, we call them neutral, but most of the, in most of the countries uh, there's a majority against capitalism and the, the people who were more, most pro-capitalist were people from Poland, mm -hmm. United States, Czech Republic, South, South Korea, uh, also in Argentina they had a positive, so these, these are countries where people have a positive approach. Uh, you mentioned that our country, Czech Republic, belongs to countries that are probably uh, among the most yes. pro-capitalism country. But I think, uh, I, I will find it quite fast, that uh, still the numbers are not too high. It's about, about mid, about 46, 48 percent of people who, who would agree with the capitalism as a way of living. Are you, uh, we, we, we haven't calculated as a percentage, but we calculated something that we call the pro- and anti-capitalism coefficient. Mm -hmm. So we had these 34 different statements, okay. and then we calculated the uh, average percentage of positive and negative uh, um, statements and then we divided this and then it came out to a coefficient oh, okay. and, and everything it's, that is bigger than one means positive and everything that is less than one means negative and the, the highest uh, score was in uh, Poland, uh, yes Poland, United States and Czech Republic also. No, in, in Czech Republic even if you look among the different political uh, groups here okay, in the Czech Republic, okay, uh -huh. you see that only the very left-leaning people are really against capitalism, the people in the center are more neutral, mm -hmm. and the moderate right and the right-wingers are pro-capitalism. Pro only far left are really against uh, uh, capitalism uh, here in, in the Czech Republic. You know, we, we, we ask people to put position themselves on a left-right scale. So zero means extreme left, ten means extreme right, and five means center. Okay. And for example, the people like seven, this would be in, uh, not far right, but uh, moderate right, they were the most pro-capitalist mm -hmm, here mm -hmm, in the Czech mm -hmm. Republic. All right. Uh, what surprised me that the France is not too pro-capitalist country, but maybe it's not surprising at the end. No, I was uh, not surprised at all. France is absolute, uh, uh, maybe the homeland of the, the of the anti-capitalists. You see, <laughs> to, to, to Thomas Piketty, the most famous uh, anti-capitalist uh, author today, he, he's French, and this is not an. Uh, it's, it, you, you will find it in, in France, we, we had another survey before, maybe I should tell you something about this, a survey in now 13 countries, it was about social envy mm -hmm. and the image of wealthy people. And for this other survey, we calculated something that we called the social envy coefficient mm -hmm. to compare yeah. how envious people you are in different countries. And by far the most envious people were in France. All right. in, in, in this survey, followed by Germany, our country, and the least envious were Vietnam, Japan, South Korea, these, these Asian countries. So with France, this was not Again. a surprise for me. Uh, probably uh, France is the, oh, maybe the only European country where your books are not published. So they yes. want to get rid of you. <laughs> yes, ab ab absolutely. It's published even in the smallest uh, in the smallest countries, even in Albania or Montenegro and in Bosnia and in Serbia, of course, in Poland, Czech Republic and uh, in, in, of course, in, in Italy and Spain, but not in France. They, yeah. Don't, yeah. they don't like to... to there's, there's a problem with, with anti-capitalists. For example, if you look in the bibliography from my book, you, you can find a lot of book from uh, anti-capitalists, not mm -hmm. only uh, Marx, Engels, Lenin, but you find, of course, PKT and uh, a lot of others, but I, I know a lot of anti-capitalists, they, they would read a book like this. They prefer to buy book number 35, Why Capitalism is Evil, yes. than only to touch. I find it something on Twitter when I 
Twitter something about my book, and then there are these people, ah, this book is totally shit, and it's, uh, so it's, it's everything wrong. And then I ask them, but have you read the book? No, I, 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 I wouldn't read it. And so I think this is a problem that, um, so I, I don't write my books because I think uh, I can convince anti-capitalists. This is mm -hmm. not my target group. It's written for people who are maybe emotional, a little bit more pro-market economy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they don't have the facts. They don't okay. have the arguments. When they have a discussion with anti-capitalists, they don't have the figures. And so you want to feed them? Uh, yes, exactly. This was the idea. You don't even have to read the whole book. For example, next week we have a discussion with anti-capitalists about climate change or environmental destruction. You don't have to read the whole book. Read chapter three, you will have all the arguments. Next week you will have another discussion about uh, inequality. Read chapter two, then you have all, okay. the, all the arguments about this stuff. And this is on the one hand a book I used uh, three, more than 350 uh, uh, books and scientific papers. So I, I read a lot for, mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. this and I gave it to a lot of uh, experts, economists, uh, sociologists, uh, political scientists uh, to, to read it before. But, uh, and of course not everyone can, can read so many books and scientific mm -hmm. uh, uh, papers and so it's with almost 900 footnotes but hopefully I think it's easily written because I was a journalist for a lot of uh, years and so yes. I don't like books that are written so in it uh, and, and this is the real purpose for the book P uh, to, to, to feed this is good for me to, to feed people to give them the, 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 the facts All about right. capitalism. So please let's clear the topic you say that capitalism is the only way is it right? or the best way? I would say capitalism is the solution for, the, for most of the problems that we have today. If we speak about hunger, about poverty, about environment, about a lot of other topics, I think that more capitalism. I'm, I'm not an advocate of something like 100% capitalism because mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. doesn't exist anywhere in the world. You don't have there, there's even no country with 100% socialism. Even uh, in, for example, in socialist countries, we had some p elements of market and private pro property. In Czech Republic, not so much, but for mm -hmm. example, in, in Poland or uh, in, in Hungary, and so you had, even in socialist countries, some mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. private property and market. And even in North Korea, you have only, of course, very, very small, very, 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 very small. And of course, in capitalist countries, you have a lot of state intervention, a lot of socialism, even in the United States. So I have always more the metaphor of a test tube and where you have two ingredients, mm -hmm. market, state, capitalism, socialism. And then I see what happens if you add more market mm -hmm. and what happens if you add more state. This is my, my theory, and I give you only uh, two examples maybe. Look in, in China. China, in the end of the 50s, there was the biggest socialist experiment in history, the so-called Great Leap Forward. Yeah. 45 million people died there. Terrible hunger, uh, the, 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 the poverty. Real, the real bad. problem is that most of the people have never heard at school about it. Uh, I have these lectures everywhere in the world. Uh, two days ago I had it here in the Czech Republic and it's everywhere in the world the same. I make a test everywhere. I ask people who have heard at school about the Great Leap Forward where 45 million people died. If I have an audience from some hundred people, there are maybe three or four uh -huh. who raise their hands. Uh -huh. It's everywhere in the world, whether I'm in Asia, in the United States or here in Europe. So this, uh, the, the, the other book from, from me about capitalism starts with the Great Leap Forward. This was at the end of the 50s. Then even in 1981, in China, 88% of the population lived in extreme poverty, 88%. Mm -hmm. Then Deng Xiaoping introduced this uh, uh, pro-market reforms, mm -hmm. private mm -hmm. property. In my metaphor, he put more market yeah, in the, to test the tube. Yes. Yes. And what happened? Today, the number of people living in extreme poverty is less than 1% in China. It's amazing. Hundreds of millions of people came out of extreme poverty or take Vietnam, I was there right now. In Vietnam, in, even in the beginning of the 90s, there were 80% of the population lived in poverty. 80% mm -hmm. today is less than 5%. Why? Because in 1986 they started with their so-called Doi Moi reforms in Vietnam, pro-market mm -hmm. reforms. Today they call themselves socialists. 
but it's harder to find a Marxist in Vietnam than in Europe or in the United States uh, if, if you discuss there with, with people. And the other example, take Venezuela as an example. 1970, Venezuela was one of the 20 richest countries in the world. Most That's people right. don't know this. It, would be. it was near to the UK and so. Then they started with a lot of labor market regulation. I, I think you have also a lot of labor market regulation here mm -hmm. in Czech Republic, but it was even worse than in your country. More and more labor. And what happened? Situation became worse. And but and people, they, they but they had then the wrong conclusion. They sometimes they think, okay, uh, the situation isn't getting better, and so we have to. Uh, move faster on the same way. Mm -hmm. And so they they voted for Hugo Chavez in 1999. And it was and, the trouble. And, and, and all the left-wing intellectuals all over the world were really enthusiastic. They called it the socialism in 21st century. And in the first years, it worked because in this time, it was good for him, the oil prices increased. They were wow. 10 times higher. And he had a lot of money to spend not only for his people, but even he helped people in Cuba and even in Boston in the United States. But then uh, oil prices came back. They started with nationalization and with all this social stuff. The result, they had a hyperinflation, 1 billion percent. Mm -hmm. 25 of the population, 25 percent of the population fled from Venezuela. People had hunger. The, the democracy, free freedom of speech, and so was uh, was abolished, and so it's it's only some examples what happens if you add more market. And I I think I don't have to tell you if you compare the situation now in Czech Republic with, for no. example, the 70s and so. On. Of yep. course, people are better off. Maybe some forgot it, and maybe some have nostalgia. We want to back, go back to socialism because they they forgot what it means. But I think there can be no discussion that people in Czech Republic are better off today than they were, for example, mm -hmm. in, in socialist times. I think the main topic is uh, how it should be mixed in the test tube. How yes. much of socialism? How much of a uh, open market? Uh, there's not a real a percentage that I say it should be this and that. Or maybe uh, some points that you would say usually and, and, this and point and is I, important. I, uh, I don't know any country today, nowhere in the world, where you have too much free market in the test mm -hmm. tube. I don't know anyone. So everywhere in every country, it's not a bad idea to put in more, 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 more market. And so, and, and the most important thing, it's not about the absolute relation. This is not the most important thing. It's about the development. It's maybe it was, it started with 90, 10, and even if it is then 70, 30, situation becomes better. This is the good thing with capitalism. You, you don't need it poor. Even some drops of capitalism can help sometimes okay. uh, a lot. So cooking the best uh, cocktail, you would say it's never a mistake to put more capitalism. But what is really wrong if you made it almost clear socialism? This is your opinion. So to, today, I don't know. Of course, in theory, you can think about a country that has too much market. But today, I don't know okay. such a country nowhere in the world. And um, I'm not. Uh, I. I I don't look for utopia of 100% capitalism because I don't like any utopia. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. like utopia from socialism. I don't like utopia from pure capitalism. Uh, I, I'm a historian, and so I prefer to th compare things that you can compare. For yeah, example, to talk here, about real, to yes, talk about real possibilities. Because here in this book, for example, yeah. I compare North Korea, South Korea, East Germany, West Germany, Chile. Venezuela, China at Mao's time and after. This is my approach that mm -hmm. I compare things that I can compare. Socialists do something else. They compare their utopia, something that's written in a book, mm -hmm. with the reality. And it okay. would be the same. I don't know. I, I, are you married? Yes. So, for example, imagine you come home this evening and your wife asks you, we have to talk. And it's about divorce. I hope you would be surprised. But then yes. I tell you what happened. She started to read this romantic love mm -hmm. novels that you can get there maybe at the railway station and 
where they love, they kiss every morning and everything is perfect. And yeah. then she compared your marriage mm -hmm. with these romantic love novels. It would be pretty tough even with me, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how is it with you, but for most of the relationships, people would say this isn't really fair. Uh, please, mm -hmm. uh, uh, please, uh, please, if you uh, compare something, compare maybe our relationship with our neighbors yeah. or with Peter. I understand what friends. you have on your mind. And, and not with to keep utopia. in reality. Yes, and, and this is what socialists do. They, they, they compare their ideas there in, in the books with the reality and mm -hmm. this is something I don't like. So maybe your message is come on, go back to the earth, let's, let's touch the ground, let's be living in a real. Yes, cooperate, think about each other, but we should be in reality, not in utopia, not only in ideals. Uh, and let's combine the systems that work. Um, I, I like to, for example, to take lessons from history. So, you mm -hmm. know, this is, I'm a historian, so I think always about history. And what I don't understand, they tried this anti-capitalist utopia or socialism in so many different ways in the last mm -hmm. century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More than 24 different experiments. They tried it in Yugoslavia in a different way than in China, yes. in yes. North Korea in another way than as in Bulgaria, or in Czech Republic in a different way than in Poland. And they tried it in, in so many ways, but it worked nowhere. It failed without any exception. There's not any one case where uh, socialism improved standard of living or people be, be, were, were better off. And I give you another, uh, maybe a funny example, but this is, would be the same. Imagine a, a housewife, she bakes a cake and mm -hmm. invites guests Saturday. And guests get, get sick, even they have to, to vomit. So she understands, okay, something was wrong with the recipe. Then she, she changes a little bit, some slight modification, and invite guests next Saturday. What happened? Guests vomit again. So she understands, oh, this was not the good idea take the same recipe, I have to change something else, I have to make some more modification. Okay, bakes again the cake, invites guests, guests warm it again. And then she does it 24 times, again and again. You will tell me it's crazy, there is no housewife Better the not go to taste who, the cake again. Who, who, who would do it? No, no, You're no, right. no, no, one, no one would uh, do it, it's crazy. Yes, it is crazy, but this is exactly what socialists did. They, they tried it in so many different ways and it failed always. And I think you should have uh, listened to, to history, to, to experience of his, uh, history. And this is the only thing that, that I do. What worked and mm -hmm. what did not mm -hmm. work. It sounds interesting for me. Uh, I wonder what you will answer me to uh, some questions that you definitely have heard many times ago. Well, the situation is going really bad. Look at the scissors that are just opening wider and wider. 10% of people are owning the most of the wealth all around the world. The other people are just working for them. What do you answer for that? Now, these are two different questions. The first question I spoke about is about poverty. The other question you spoke about is about inequality. Mm -hmm. First, you have to understand that these are two totally different questions. Poverty or inequality. I spoke about poverty. and Let's remain with poverty first and I okay. come to inequality. Okay. Okay. Poverty. Before capitalism, 200 years ago, 90% of the worldwide population lived in extreme poverty. 90%. Today it's less than 10%. Even in the last decades, 1981, almost 43% of the people in the world lived in extreme poverty. Today it's less than 10%. So I say capitalism is the best thing to fight against poverty. But what is with inequality? Of course, sometimes inequality can rise. Uh, I come back to China because I spoke mm -hmm. about this. The number of people who lived in extreme, uh, extreme poverty decreased from 88 to 1 percent. But at the same time, the number of billionaires increased from zero because in socialist yeah. time there was yeah. not a billionaire. Today it's something like 700. It's as much in the United States. Even today in uh, Beijing, what a lot of people don't know, you have more billionaires than in New York. So the number of billionaires increased and number of people in poverty decreased. And inequality is higher than it was in socialist times mm -hmm. when everyone mm -hmm. was poor. Mm -hmm. 
I found no one in China who told me, let's go back to Mao's time oh, yeah. because we were more equal. And I found no one in Vietnam who told me, oh, we have now some, they have now seven billionaires even in, in Vietnam. And uh, there was no one who told me, let's go back. I think I'm, I'm not interested in inequality. I'm concerned about poverty. Okay. People who are interested mm -hmm. in inequality, this is, these are most envious people. Even in some ways, they don't care about their own situation. But, uh, and for, for example, if, if they see a gap between their own situation and someone is rich, there are two possibilities how you can react. The first thing is to think, how can I improve my situation? So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to, to make the gap maybe between me and Bill Gates a little okay. bit, not only a little bit smaller, to improve my situation. What can I learn? This is the alternative one. Alternative two is how can I make situation worse for the rich people to tear them down, mm -hmm. to make the, to, to close the gap a little bit. And I think the second thing, it's only for, for envious people. Even there are people who, who even feel better when the situation becomes worse for rich people, even if their own situation does not improve. For example, we, we, had, we had another survey. It was about the attitude towards rich people. It's published in, in also in a lot of languages. The English title is mm -hmm. Rich in Public mm -hmm. Opinion. And we asked some questions, for example, I would be in favor to increase taxes for millionaires drastically even if I have no advantage for them. Or mm -hmm. another statement, I would, I, I think we should reduce drastically CO compensations or manager's salary and distribute it more evenly among the employees, e even if everyone has only two euros more. So the same principle makes situation much worse for them. The others, they have no advantage. Or the third, third statement was, if I hear about a rich or a millionaire who loses a lot of money mm -hmm. due to a risky business, I think it serves him right. We call yes. it schadenfreude. Uh -huh. uh, do, do we have a, a similar word for this in Czech? Schadenfreude, or is it the same word? Um, I, I, I don't understand in German what it means exactly. Schadenfreude I, means I understand. You, you are happy? Uh, schadenfreude, if, if ah, yes. Uh, uh, schade as a škoda nebo smůla, freund jako přítel. Uh, yeah, but anybody who wished the bad, uh, the bad stories for the people around him. Yes, if, 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 if you hear something from successful people, something bad happens to them and you feel good. It's typical German, by the way. Germany was the only country where... It's typical German? Yes. You're, I, I'm sorry, Tom, I must interrupt you now because <laughs> many people, I'm sure, who will watch this video will say, it's typical Czech. <laughs> we usually yes. say that it's yes, typical Czech. Everyone thinks it. Uh, to be honest, I haven't had this survey in Czech Republic, this survey, the other about mm -hmm. capitalism. It would be very interesting to compare survey. the results. It, it, it would be really interesting, of course, but the Germany was by far the only country where we had more people who agreed than disagreed mm -hmm. from with the schadenfreude. And so okay. after this survey, I understood why the word schadenfreude, you know, in English, they don't have a word for this. Even the word they for took that. it from Germany because uh, it's a typical uh, term. I don't know how, how to see it. So what I mean, there are people um, who are happy when other people, when successful yeah. people... It doesn't motivate them to improve myself, but they want to just uh, destroy yes. it for them. And now I ask you something. Take two different people. One of them, he's reading books, biographies about successful, rich people. Mm -hmm. What can I learn from them? And how can I maybe build my company? Or how can, how can I improve my situation? He thinks about this. The other one, he thinks all over the day, what, how can we nationalize everything? How can we expropriate rich people? All over the day, he's, you know, with hate speech about rich people. There's a lot of hate speech, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if, whether you heard about it last year. They put even a guillotine in front of the house of Jeff Bezos. Uh -huh, no, the guillotine uh -huh. were in French Revolution. People yes, were killed to yeah, show uh, what they, Yes, and even in Germany, we had in Berlin a demonstration against the rich, and they had everywhere posters in the city with a guillotine. And there were then posters with like, kill your rich, uh, kill your landlord. Or they have on the internet, you find posters, kill the rich or something like this. And now, my question is, what do you think? Who will be in a better situation 
10 years from now. The first one who started to read oh, yeah. biographies and think about how to improve his situation, or the other one who always, you know, buy this new T-shirt on the internet to kill rich people, go here to protest, kill the rich uh, and against... I think it's, it's easy to answer who will be more successful. Yeah, the first one. Yes. And what is the source? What is the source of this anger among the people? Why is there growing just a call for equality to just tax the rich people? I think it was always in history that if situation becomes worse, if we have problems and we had a lot of problems and we have a lot of problems right now, we had this corona mm -hmm. uh, uh, situation, before we had the financial crisis, now we have the, 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 the war and we have inflation, so th th there are a lot of problems. And then people look to start for scapegoats. Mm -hmm. It was always what happened in history, in the Middle Age, for example, they looked for witches or yeah. for Jewish people. Yeah. They blamed them for the plague or uh, for even for, for every disaster because they couldn't explain it. They couldn't understand it mm -hmm. and it was easier to them to say, oh, this was their, their fault. It's, it's easier. Take as an example the financial crisis. Very complicated topic. I read a lot of books about it to understand what really happens and I'm sure maybe only one out of 1,000 uh, people understood what really yep. happened there. Mm -hmm. But if you give an easy answer, ah, these are the greedy bankers who filled their pockets. This is easy to explain, and then you have to you can point on solution, them. Yeah. Yes, do something. It's, it happens always that people look, especially for minorities, it can be Migrants, yes, it can be. It can every minority, mm -hmm. and rich people, of course, are also a minority, a very successful minority. And I think this is one of the most important uh, reasons to to look for scapegoats to explain things. You saw it when when there was the Corona crisis. I don't know how it was here in Czech Republic in Germany. We had a lot of. Uh, crazy conspiracy theories. People the same. This the was same. Bill Gates, and he made it to make some money yeah, with nano robots and, and all so, stuff. and maybe with, to put a microchip uh, in it to connect everyone with Microsoft and so. You have the craziest stories there around, and this was uh, people looked for scapegoats, and mm -hmm. rich people are idle scape scapegoat. People are envious. In most of cases, they don't understand what it means to be rich and how these people become rich. They think if, if they hear someone has 100 billion or even 200 billion about people like Jeff Bezos or uh, Elon Musk, maybe they think they have it on their bank account. But it's not. The, almost every one of them became rich as an entrepreneur, and 95 percent of their uh, of their money is uh, invested in this company. For example, yesterday I read. Elon Musk uh, lost 100 yep. billion in the last. Yes, but, but why? It's, it's, it was only because uh, if you make an estimate about his wealth, it's, it's about the, the price of, of, of the shares. And if they go up, he becomes yeah, richer he, on paper. If go it goes down, down he's it losing. becomes richer, uh, uh, poorer, always uh, on, on paper. So it's not like he has his money under the pillar or on a bank account. It is in his company, and he became rich because of a successful company. And who made him rich? You, you and I. I use Emerson. Maybe you use also Emerson. I use Google every day. You use Google. Sergey Prin, Larry Page were the Google founders. They became rich with Google. I use Microsoft. So I made Bill Gates rich. So how do you become rich in capitalism? If you have a good idea uh, that, that is useful for a lot of people, if it's useful for some hundreds of people, you get some money. If it is for even for hundreds of millions or billions, you become super rich. Great. Now is the moment I would like to ask you about these two surveys. What is the approach of the ordinary people to the wealthy people? Because you focused on that topic yes. for quite a long time, so you have the data. It's different in different uh, countries. We ask them a lot of questions, and in the end, I, I mentioned some of this as an example, and in the end, we uh, had three different groups. The enviers, the non-enviers, and then the ambivalent. You can say they are somewhere between, not Korea. Okay. And then we calculated um, the, uh, as a coefficient the number of 
enviers and non enviers in different countries. And then we could compare and we came out uh, with something that we called the social envy coefficient. And I think I, I mentioned it was highest in France, followed by Germany. And uh, at the end of this was people are not as envious in, in, the, in most of the Asian countries, especially in Japan, Vietnam, and South Korea. So they have a completely different attitude toward rich people. Maybe this is some reason, one reason why they are so successful today. Because now growing they, so they, fast. They, we are envious against them. They admire them. I was now in, in Vietnam at the university, and they invited me to a workshop. They, they read my, my book and my survey, and they made their own survey. And it was the workshop, and the topic was how to improve image of wealthy people. Can you imagine okay. such a workshop in sociology here in Europe or in the United States? No, they, it's, it's hard to, to, to imagine such a thing. So this was the, the big difference. But of course, it also depends. Example, in the United States, young people have a much more negative attitude mm -hmm. toward the rich than older people. This was in the United States, a huge difference. Um, and in Italy, for example, it was the other way around. The older people were very negative against the rich and the younger were more positive. So it's different okay. in different uh -huh. countries. It, it depends on, on age sometimes, of course, on, on income and a lot of different uh, factors. Is there some topic, some special moment that ordinary people don't like on rich people or, or something, uh, the expectation of, I don't know, snobism, expectation of selfishness? Or what, what is uh, the point? Where, where is it turning? C c did you recognize some of yes, them? Yes, of, of, of course we asked about what do you think about personality traits of rich people. And we presented to them a list with 10 different personality traits. Um, um, with some positive and some negative personality traits. No, I think it was 14, seven positive, seven mm -hmm, negative. Mm -hmm. And um, for example, negative personality traits, greed, uh, greedy and, and ruthless and these things, mm -hmm. and positive like uh, intelligent or honest. And the interesting thing is, I, t I will take some ex one example, honest. Are rich people honest? Mm -hmm. And in most of the countries, there were only very few people who said, are rich people honest? I remember in Spain and, Spain and Italy, it was only 1%. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in other countries, it was maybe like 5 or 6% who said, rich people are honest. And then we asked everyone whether he knows a millionaire in person or some millionaires. And of course, most of the people didn't know a millionaire in, in person. And then we asked only those people who know a millionaire okay, in person. Okay. And he asked them about the personality traits. And then the number of people who said he's honest mm -hmm. increased dramatic right. dramatically. For example, in Germany, it was 3% of all people said rich people are honest and if we ask the people mm -hmm. who know the rich people in person uh, whether he's honest, 42% agreed, a huge difference, 3% for it. So, and this is typical for prejudice and stereotypes, yes. we have it yes. also with other minority groups that if you don't know them, if you don't have contact to them, oh, yeah. you have your fantasy maybe from Hollywood movies, for example. I had one interview with a journalist and he was very left-leaning, but in a way, I liked him, he liked me. And in the end of the interview, he asked me, please be, be, be honest for a moment. I think in reality, the super rich are like these people we know from James Bond movies. So <laughs> like greedy and want to conquer the world. Isn't it correct? Then I, I, I asked him back, I said, okay, how many multi-billionaires do you know in person? Zero. How many billionaires do you know in person? Zero. How many people who owe some hundreds of millions, you know, in person, zero. How many single mi millionaire, and he, he knew not even mm -hmm. a single mi uh, 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 millionaire, so he, he knew none of them. And I told him, okay, this is the difference between you and me. I wrote, I have two PhDs, so my second doctoral dissertation was mm -hmm. about the psychology of super rich people, and I had their interviews with 
45 super rich people. So this is the difference between you and me. I know them in person and you know, know them from James Bond movies. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem sometimes that people know them only from the, from the media. It's very interesting that now we are touching uh, the two imagination parts or, or, or two parts from, Im from the world of imagination, of thoughts. Uh, the ideal of socialism which in imagination sounds nice, yes. but never happened till now. Yes. Hopefully, we will see. And again, uh, the type of personality of super rich people in imaginative world, they are the wrong one. They are the bad ones. And, uh, yes, and I tell you what. One of the reasons there is a core belief of all these people uh, that is wrong. I call it the zero sum thinking. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Zero sum thinking. It means they believe that rich people became only rich because they took away mm -hmm. from the poor. Of yeah. course, good men cannot get rich. The yes. honest people cannot get rich. Yes. They, of this course, is you know it's good if you say, okay, I'm not financially successful, but this is only because I'm morally superior, and so yeah, this is yeah, not the reason. Yeah. It's my and decision the, and, somehow. And the others are so bad with so bad moral. This is the of course this feels better if you. If this is your explanation why you are not uh, mm -hmm. not successful, mm -hmm. but the belief I call it zero sum theory, and why is it wrong the zero sum theory that the rich people became rich because they take away from the poor? You remember what I said about the numbers of people living in poverty all over the world? It decreased from forty two point seven percent in in nineteen eighty one. To less than 10% today. At the same time, I know only now the number from 2000 to now, the number of billionaires increased from 500 to 2800. I told you the same example from China, where number of people in poverty decreased, number of billionaires increased. If zero sum thinking would be correct, how to explain it? From where mm -hmm. did they take mm -hmm. it, the rich people? Of course, they couldn't take it away from the poor because the, the standards of living from poor people. So this is the proof that zero-sum thinking is totally nonsense. But there are some groups of people who believe in it. The first groups are prisoners. Mm -hmm. Everyone who is in prison share this belief. Everyone, you say? In, in prison, of course. Why is he in prison? Because he thought you can only reach if you take it away from the poor. So all prisoners mm -hmm. believe in zero-sum thinking. They don't believe that they can make money in an honest way. Mm -hmm. They believe that they have to take That's why they do it the way like they do it. something mm -hmm. away. Uh, away. Thing. And this is the first group. And the other one is at universities like left-leaning sociologists and mm -hmm. so they, they believe. So these are the intellectuals. These are the two uh, kind of people who believe in this zero. And of course, there are, it's only a joke, but there, there are a lot of other people who believe okay. in this stuff. Zero-sum thinking is the real problem and it's, it's totally wrong. Okay. So the last topic I would like to touch in our interview, this is about uh, your survey with the super rich people. So now tell me, what are they like? Of course, you look for something that they have in common. Uh, I wrote this book, uh, the, the Wealth Elite, Psychology of Super Rich People. I, I mentioned this in interviews and I looked, of course, what, for things that they have in common. First of all, not all rich people are the same, in the same way as not all poor people are the no. same. This is correct on the one hand. On the other hand, of course, you can find some patterns that they have in common. And I will mention only a few. For example, one thing is they enjoy swimming against the stream. Mm -hmm, they are mm -hmm. non-conformists. Mm -hmm. I, I give you an exam one example. This was not one of the, my interviews, but I, I, I know him well, Jim Rogers. Jim Rogers was in the 80s one of the most successful investors. He managed this S&P, uh, he managed this quantum fund together with George Soros. This fund made 4,200% in the same time when the S&P gained only 47%. So he was really successful at this time, became very rich. Later on, by the way, he traveled all over the world, but with a motorbike, 120 mm -hmm. countries. And he told me this story. When he was young, he was invited to a fancy dinner in, in Manhattan. And all of the others were older than him, bankers, 
in Mestus, and some of them were said to the neighbor, not very loud, but so loud that everyone could hear it, how can someone be so stupid to buy locket chairs? Mm -hmm. Locket at this time, the company was really in trouble. Every day there were bad news in the newspapers, and, um, and if you looked at the stock exchange, the prices went down and down and down, decreased. He was the one who bought it, and everyone laughed very loud, and he felt very bad because they laughed at him. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he told me, I felt very bad at this time. But later on, I made a lot of money, and I learned the louder they laugh at you, the better it is. Mm -hmm. And then in my book, I spoke with one of the richest men in Germany. His name is Theo Müller. He became uh, rich with milk and with uh, yogurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we know the brand. Yes, and, and he's very rich. And, I, and he gave me an, an example, only a, a picture, because his favorite animals are cows, of course. Hmm. And he told me the story. There's a herd of cows walking along a path. And the left side, there's a very green and lush field with a lot of grass. And on the right hand, there's a field that is not as near as lush, only some grams of grass. And then 99 out of this 100 cows go on the, to the left side. Mm -hmm. What happens, the grass is eaten very fast. And the, uh, what, only one cow goes to the right side. This cow eats and eats and eats. It has more grass than the other. And he told me, I'm the cow, go to the right side. No, and right. This is the same what happened for me. You know, I became wealthy with, also with this, what you call, contrarian investment. It was mm -hmm. 20 years ago in, in, in Berlin, the residential market, everyone warned me mm -hmm. to uh, invest. The, the, the banks warned me and the so-called experts told me it's a bad idea because the, the, the rents decreased or stagnated and the prices stagnated. They told me it's a bad idea, but I made my analysis and I believe that th this will change. Mm -hmm. So I could buy very, very cheap at this time. And 10 years later, when everyone was bullish about Berlin residential market, all people invested here from all over the world and prices increased a lot. Then I started to sell mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I sold everything four times higher price. For example, I bought for a million and uh, saw, sold them for 4.2 million, okay. something mm -hmm. like this. So this is one thing, for example, to, to enjoy swimming against the stream. And the uh, so. courage to do non-conformist yes. decisions. Another thing, another thing is um, don't blame other people for your setbacks and crisis, or most uh, mm -hmm. and feedbacks, most, uh, uh, setbacks. Most people are this way. If they are successful, they take responsibility for their success. They are proud, are mm -hmm. smart, and to their wife. Now you see how smart Look I. at me. It but if they fail, they blame other people. They uh -huh. It's your at, fault. At you blame me. Yes, it's the teacher's fault or. Uh, maybe uh, it's capitalist society or it's their parents or their boss or whoever. And this is different with this uh, rich, successful people. They took responsibility not only for the, their success, but also for their failure. Mm -hmm, and I think mm -hmm. this is very important because uh, if you take the risk, uh, uh, whom you blame, you give the power. And if you blame other people, you give power to other people. If okay. you blame yourself, you have, you have the power. This is... Uh, this is another thing. Of, of course, there are these, are, these are only two examples, but there are a lot of other things that these uh, rich people have, uh, have in, in common. But, but one, and something was not important. For example, I asked them about their performance at school or university. I wanted to find out whether there's a correlation between their a study. Uh -huh. uh, grades at school or university and their later financial. There was absolutely no correlation. There were no some, correlation? No, there were some that were very good at school, some were really bad. They even had no high school mm -hmm. degree that were really bad and you c can find not any uh, connection. Something that was more important was their experience outside school, alongside school. For example, Half of them were competitive athletes, mm -hmm. so they and they learned a lot, uh, or, or and and a lot of them. They I asked them how did you earn money alongside school, outside school, and they didn't do it for they didn't work for an hourly wage. When I was mm -hmm. a student, most of the other students some worked in a restaurant, others taxi driver, or even in a factory for an hourly wage. 
but this is what they 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 did it something say they did something else for example they they, they sold things mm -hmm. sales or skills are very important if you want to become rich they sold a lot of things that so they had the experience mm -hmm. and they learned and this learning experience were much important and this is what is so important to understand in the psychology we distinguish between two ways how you can learn the one way we call explicit learning it's uh, school university reading books explicit learning the other way we call implicit learning it means learning by doing or the school of life and the result from implicit learning is implicit knowledge or mm -hmm. to have an word that is easier to understand it's the same as intuition and gut feeling and a lot of these rich people told me of course they analyze things but more important is intuition and gut feeling mm -hmm. but this mm -hmm. intuition is not something irrational or mystical it's only a result from this implicit learning experience so this were some results from my uh, of course there are a lot of others it's a book with 500 pages with this uh, interviews with this uh, super rich people all right thank you very much for the interview thanks again we touch the topics we yes. open the doors <laughs> now we can enter thank you very much thank you good thank luck you. Thanks so much for listening all the way through. This was today's explosive houseboat talk about defending capitalism and rich people. What do you think? Thanks for listening, thanks for every like and subscription, and thanks for any contribution to the debate. Hi, you're Peter.